to welcome Professor Morgan Fouquet, who is highly specialized in bacterial cancer. And he is going to provide us an update on bladder cancer management. What are we doing wrong? During this presentation, you are very welcome to ask questions through our system. So you have to use the question window. So please do not use the function raise your hand function. And a few questions will be selected and answers will be given by Professor Morgan Roucré at the end of the talk. So please, Morgan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Veronique. It's a pleasure for me to start this first webinar from the European School of Urology, an initiative which is uh, very positive for all of us because it's a new way to get connected. And tonight, we'll go into the matter of bladder cancer. And I choose a very provocative title, which is a deck on bladder cancer management. What are we doing wrong? So during the next 20 minutes, we are going to uh, go through the problems, the current problem in the management of bladder cancer. And then I will be happy to take a few minutes to answer your points. And if there is not enough time, you can still raise your points through uh, email or through, through the social network is the epidemiology in the Western world of bladder cancer, which is uh, 70 to 80 percent non-muscle invasive bladder cancer cases, compared to muscle invasive bladder cancers in only 20 to 30 percent. The epidemiology is likely to change according to the catchment area and the geographic um, uh, zone where you are living. The median age at diagnosis is 65 years old, so it's not compared to other carcinoma in the field of urology. The main problem that we have in bladder cancer, when we compare the mortality from the CR database, all stages, there is no decrease in the mortality in the last four years, despite all the new technologies, the new knowledge, the new treatment that we have. We didn't impact on the mortality of bladder cancer, and we should we should be ashamed of that. This is the reason why we have to struggle for better knowledge and a better care in the field of bladder cancer. Look at this slide, which is also very demonstrative on the mortality of bladder cancer. The cancer, the bladder, is in the middle, uh, less 0.1. There is no variation in a five-year rate change on mortality of bladder cancer about, uh, on a period of five years in the United States as well. So it's totally neutral, and then we have no impact on the, on the, on the mortality of bladder cancer, and that's a real issue. M most importantly is to discriminate, as I said, the muscle invasive bladder cancer and the non-muscle invasive cancer, because the stage distribution is not the same, but as you can see on the high part of the slide and on the table, that the mortality is totally different when you compare a localized disease to a distant disease. And so the strategy is going to be palliative versus curative, and the, the, the ability to treat the tumor is the, going to be totally different according to the preoperative workup or the, the pre-treatment workup you are going to uh, propose to the patient. One of the points that comes to our mind when it comes to bladder cancer is to discuss the medical economic issue. Uh, of course, it is very difficult to compare healthcare system all around the world according to your country where you live and you practice the medicine. But on a medical economic perspective, for sure, we can say that bladder cancer is very time consuming when it comes to nurses, urologists, all the time that we spend to do the surveillance, the flexible cystoscopy, the uh, um, urine culture. It is very costly on the long run. And it's the fifth, it's considered so far as the fifth most expensive cancer on a global perspective uh, per patient. So that is a real issue because in our modern world, money is an issue and we need also to keep that in mind when it comes to the treatment of bladder cancer. So one question that we could raise and you can answer in your, uh, in your head or uh, through the, um, the question, um, the question of the system of the webinar: What is the main risk factor for bladder cancer? I, I would, um, I have proposed uh, four answers. The first is occupational exposure. B is ionizing radiation. C is schistosomiasis. D is tobacco smoking. And of course, 
the answer is tobacco smoking. And one of the main issues that we have as urologists, even though we are surgeons, we are also doctors, and as a doctors, we should spend time uh, uh, emphasizing, underlying the fact that the patient should quit smoking when he is diagnosed with bladder cancer. And sometimes your patient came to your office and tells you, it's too, it's too late, doctor, it's the only pleasure that I have, I would like to keep smoking because I'm diagnosed, it's too late. And we have data from the literature saying that there is a strong prognosis on the outcome of the cancer when the patient is keeping smoking. So you should take time to avoid smoking and to explain to the patient that it is a major issue and he has to manage himself his disease by stop smoking. That's a, a real point. Many, many, many patients and organizations are not aware of the problem of bladder cancer, and I'm, I'm traveling tomorrow to Bruxelles, to the European Parliament, to um, talk about the white paper from the European Cancer Patient Coalition on bladder cancer. So that is not only an issue, an issue for urologists, not only an issue for the healthcare system and the governments, but also for the patients, and there are messages that we can send to the population dealing with bladder cancer and to make them aware of this disease, which is not rare. So smoking issue is a major issue and we have to emphasize it to our patient, to the other doctors and to our medical students. When it comes to bladder cancer, of course, we have to keep in mind that in the vast majority of cases we are dealing with urotelial carcinomas. It means so urotelial carcinomas from the bladder, but also from the upper urinary tract. And do not forget that these two entities, the two distinct cancers are linked because it is the same urotelium that, that is all over the urotelial cavities and that is very important also not to forget about the upper tract when you diagnose a bladder cancer. One issue when it comes to non-muscle invasive bladder cancer is stratification. As I told you, and you, uh, this is why I raised this question, what is the wrong treatment about bladder cancer? A. Carcinoma in situ, T1, high red bladder cancer are from high risk group. B. Median age at diagnosis of bladder cancers is 80 years old. C. Nearly 80% of bladder cancer are non muscle invasive bladder cancer at the time of diagnosis. D. It's the fifth most expensive cancer. So the wrong statement was median age is 60 years old and not 80, it's B. And I gave you all the uh, information in the previous slides, but the uh, slideshow will be available after the webinar if you want to go through it again. So non muscle invasive bladder cancer, major issue, risk stratification group. You have to discriminate, as we do in prostate cancer with the Danico classification between low risk, intermediate and high risk, we do the same in bladder cancer using other classification, E or RTC or Queto for the Spanish people, and we use low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk. And you see on the slides according to which criteria. That is really important because when you make the good risk stratification, then after you make the good treatment. And as you can see on the slide, as soon as there is a carcinoma in situ, the patient is in the high risk group. So you can imagine you can imagine very easily that if from the beginning you made a mistake and you did not diagnose the carcinoma in situ, then you will wrongly classify the patient and you will propose the wrong treatment. And if you propose the wrong treatment from the first primary tumor, then there is a very uh, a, a wrong outcome in the disease and whatever surveillance you will manage or whatever treatment you will propose after. One other issue is the T1G3 or T1I grade, which is called the transition form that is really important. You have to understand that it is almost invasive uh, tumor and that is a moment where the question of early cystectomy should arise, could be, an, uh, could be a decision that is not easy to take because some, some teams are advocating a very invasive endoscopic treatment and installation treatment in the T1I grade and some people are saying, these patients are suitable directly for early cystectomy. When you look at the guidelines, you have to understand that when you are di diagnosing a T1, a T1 high grade, it's transition form, very difficult to manage, and very particular situation. So, predicting recurrence and progression in patients with non-muscle invasive bladder cancer is linked 
with the EOR T-series tables. And for the factors that are linked on the table and that are displayed on the slide, you can see that the number of tumors is very important. So you need to depict very adequately the number of tumors. The tumor size, of course, and the cutoff of 3 cm has been chosen in the EORTC. It can be a matter of debate, but so far it's still 3 cm. The number of recurrence, the T category, of course, the grade, as we know, and as you can see, the weight of CIS on the progression is 6, so it means that it's very important. And one issue is the fact that non-muscle invasive bladder cancer are going to recur in more than one cases out of two. It's a lot. And the real question is why? It is because, is it because it is the natural history of the disease? Is it because we missed, as urologists, the diagnosis of carcinoma in situ? Is it because we did an incomplete transuretral resection of the bladder? Or also, and that's a theory, a sealing on the site of the TURB? So many questions and guidelines. There are guidelines that are available either in the field of non-muscle invasive bladder cancer or in the field of muscle invasive bladder cancer displayed by the EAU that are very solid, robust guidelines based on a high level of evidence with a high grade of recommendation. But when it comes to guidelines, you can see from this paper which was released in cancer a few years ago, 2011, that from the experience in the daily practice out of 4,500 patients, only one received all the recommended measures. So, of course, we can say that there are challenges in the field of bladder cancer, but we have to admit also as urologists that we do not stick to the guidelines and we do not stick enough to the good practice, and that is something that we should admit and we should, we should try to impact and to improve that because the, the level of evidence in the field of the guidelines of bladder cancer is very high. What are the general objectives? You are going to increase the quality of delivered health care in bladder cancer and thus try to decrease the recurrence and the progression. You are going to use in a better manner the available treatments in therapeutic strategies and of course this is research area, find new treatments. But so far, can we do better with the available tools? The answer is yes. So non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. First step, as urologists, we have a very important, uh, a, a very important step to deliver. is a surgical step, which is the, which is the endoscopic procedure. It's called the transuretral resection of the bladder tumor, and it is a very important step because it is an opportunity to make the good diagnosis, but also to treat the patient. It's not a biopsy. It's a real endoscopic partial cystectomy. And when you look at the cost of bladder cancer, you can see that the cost for bladder cancer is not coming from cystectomy or multimodality treatment or follow-up, it's coming from the TORBT, transuretral resection of the bladder in more in nearly 70% of the cases. So it is an important step, but also if you can decrease the number of TORBT that you are going to perform, it's very important. And the presence of the detrusor muscle is a surrogate of the quality of the TURBT that you are going to perform. And that's coming not from the urologist, but from the pathologist. And that's also linked with the operator experience. There is, as we do in robotic surgery, in endoscopic surgery, in open surgery, a learning curve in learning a good TURB. What are we going to call a bladder transuretral resection? It's a not a biopsy, as I told you, it's a real partial cystectomy, it's a real surgical uh, procedure, and it does, not, it does not have to be neglected, either by a junior surgeon or by a senior surgeon. It's a very important, because you can have side effects, you can have adverse events, by bleeding, obturator nerve reflux, perforation, you can face a tumor in the diverticular, there is also, you, you need to spare the ureteral, ureteral meatus, and most of the time, we have to admit that at, in certain uh, hospitals or where the schedule in the OR is very, very busy, the transuretral resection of the bladder can be performed by a junior or non-experimented urologist 
it's one of the first procedure in which you are alone. It seems to be easy, but it's not. You can leave some junior behind you. It's not at risk. It's very busy. I'm very busy, so I leave the junior. And so we have to emphasize the fact that the transuretralization of the bladder is one of the most important steps in the management. And never think that because a re-resection, a second look is possible, it's an opportunity to leave some tumor behind you. It's not the case. If you go for a transuretralization of the bladder, you have to be exhaustive and to remove entirely the tumor. So you do not have to end up into a bladder resection poorly performed, a BRPP. You have to avoid this situation and to focus enough to perform a good surgery. There are some new technologies that are available that may be interesting in the quality of the uh, removal of the tumor. Because when you use a classical transuretralization of the bladder on the left part of the slide, as you can see on the picture that is displayed, you send to a pathologist, I would say, few, uh, few specimens, and the tissue preservation is not that good and there is electr uh, electric uh, cautery that can be difficult for the pathologist to discriminate, diagnosis. So the end block resection has been proposed, it's still under evaluation, but it's honestly maybe a good technology to provide better specimen to the pathologist and to provide better diagnosis, more, uh, a most, a more accurate diagnosis. What are the challenges in bladder cancer? So, as I told you, increase the detection of bladder cancer and frac lesion because you are not always facing a bulky lesion or a very exophytic tumor. You can face a frac lesion. And if you leave behind you a frac lesion because you focus too much on a very bulky tumor, then, once again, your patient is going to end up into a dead end because you will you will not improve the recurrence rate uh, survival of the patient and you will decrease uh, his ability to survive from the disease. One tool that is very interesting and that under the guidelines is the use of blue light cystoscopy, what it's called PDD, and it's a technology that is not so new because you make an installation before the TURBT and it will change the spectrum of the line during the, pro, uh, the light during the procedure to emphasize the flat lesion or the tiny lesion that you have difficulty to see. As uh, mentioned on the slide, you can see that you have a small spot in the bladder wall that is difficult to see or a flat lesion or a bulky tumor that you left behind you, you have left behind you a part of the foot of the tumor. And as you can see here, using the, the white light, it can be difficult to see whether or not you have left tumor behind you and using the blue light, you can have, in some cases, very interesting indication to avoid leaving tumor behind you. Look at this flat lesion in the center of the slide that is quite demonstrative, I think. But if it is demonstrative on the slide or during a lecture, during a congress, is it really demonstrative in the daily practice? That's a real issue because some of you, we have all been to Congress live surgeries and it's very nice and it's very uh, agreeable video and it's very easy and you go back to your OR and it's bleeding and the technique is not working. But the point is that the blue light can help in many situations and you should consider it when there is a positive cytology before the TURBT. Positive cytology is linked and correlated significantly with hybrid lesion. And where there is a positive cytology, there is a high risk of flat lesion and carcinoma in situ. So I'm not saying today that you should do blue light cystoscopy in every case. But if it's available in your department, then you should consider to do cytology before any TURBT. And maybe, in case of positive cytology, go for a blue light cystoscopy. That's a good way to discriminate and to choose the cases in which you are going to propose a blue light for your patient. And also, point is the urine cytology. A good pathologist is crucial in bladder cancer, and you should do a urine cytology before a TURBT. Some people are going to argue against you and tell you it's not necessary, you have a positive ultrasound, you see the tumor, we should go and remove, for it, and remove it. But the point is, when there is, a discrimin uh, when there is a situation, when you remove a tumor in the bladder, which is low grade, and you have a high grade cytology before, the transuretral resection of the bladder, then 
you need to search for a flat lesion or maybe in tumor of the upper tract. So it's a very meaningful information to get a good urine cytology before the TURBT. Talking back about the blue light cystoscopy, you can see from the slide that there are different countries in Europe, of course, we are all aware of that, but the use of the blue light cystoscopy is recommended in European guidelines, in national guidelines, but the specific indications are not always mentioned, and in France, in, uh, in, for instance, in France, we are very, uh, a little bit more specific on the use of blue light, trying to pinpoint the cases in which we should do uh, and target the, the cases in which we should do good li uh, blue lights, but for sure it's a technology that is valu valuable in the detection of carcinoma in situ. We don't know yet that uh, whether or not the blue light has an impact on the progression rate and survival, but it decreases the recurrence for sure. Risk stratification, as I mentioned, is crucial. You can see from the left part of the slide that when you risk uh, stratify appropriately the tumor, then you will decide on the appropriate treatment after. And for sure, if you missed the stratification of the tumor and you missed, for instance, the carcinoma in situ, you may restratify the patient in the, the box of low risk tumor and then propose surveillance, which is not adequate. When you have a high risk, which is in fact, the vast majority of cases that you are going to face in your daily practice, then you should go for installation, and BCG uh, is the gold standard in that situation. Remember that BCG is the only drug which is efficient against carcinoma in situ, and when you have a positive diagnosis of my, uh, carcinoma in situ, whatever the chemotherapy you are going to use in your country, mitomycin, gencitabine, whatever, it's not going to be efficient against carcinoma in situ. Muscle invasive bladder cancer, the other topic. So it's a situation you are not going to face every day in your daily practice, but for sure when you face a situation when you have a T2 at least disease, a muscle invasive disease, then you have to, to, to know that the, the gold standard treatment is going to be the surgical treatment. There is an alternative to radical cystectomy, for instance, radio chemotherapy, but for patients who are reluctant for surgery, or uh, when the anesthesiologist is reluctant for surgery for the patient, but in the vast majority of cases, you are going to propose a radical cystectomy. But what would be a so-called triple A radical cystectomy? And that's a question that I would like to raise to the audience. Which factors, in your opinion, are linked with pejorative outcomes in muscle invasive bladder cancer? A, it's a delay of more than three months between diagnosis and radical cystectomy. B, high volume providers for radical cystectomy. C, absence of new adjuvant chemotherapy before cystectomy. And D, the surgical approach. I propose to you to go through the slides and you will see and you will find the answers to this uh, MCQ. The length of time. Please keep in mind that when it comes to bladder cancer, it's an emergency and you need to reschedule your OR, if it's full already, to find a room for your patient to undergo the surgery. Whatever it is, if it's a transuretralization of the bladder or a radical cystectomy, you have to consider that it is an emergency. There is this color code that we have released a few years ago with the team of uh, Paris, dealing with several uh, data in the literature, dealing with the length of time and the importance in the length of time. The, you can see from the color code that it's very uh, easy to understand. From the green uh, color, uh, you can wait. From the orange, it's a window of opportunity that you should uh, go for the surgery. And red, it's already too late. And when you compare, for instance, a PCA low risk to a non-muscle invasive or muscle invasive bladder cancer case, you can see that the window of opportunity to make the treatment possible for the patient is small. So you need to decide rapidly and you have to keep in mind that the patient does, does not have to be the victim of the administration of your hospital or uh, the schedule in the OR which, is, which, can, which can be dedicated to functional urology, for instance, on a special day. And we, you, might, you need to find an agreement in your team dealing with bladder cancer that it is an emergency. Another point of criteria that you need to provide during cystectomy is an lymphadenectomy. 
we don't know yet if it has an impact, for instance, prostate cancer, renal cell carcinoma, other tract disease, but it is for sure that we have quality data saying from uh, many, many series in the literature and experimented teams that lymphadenectomy and uh, uh, the removal of lymph nodes has an impact on the outcome of radical cystectomy, of course, and bladder cancer itself. So you need to spend a time during the surgery dedicated to the removal of the nodes. And it has to be an exhaustive dissection uh, and very large dissection. When it comes to muscle invasive bladder cancer also, th there is an influence of hospital surgical volume, and that's a point that we need to consider. And the trained neurologist should be able to do a TURBT. It's not because you deal with non-muscle invasive bladder cancer that your institution or your hospital uh, deals very often with radical cystectomy. And the problem when you look at the literature is it, you have to be brave enough to consider a real cutoff. Because when you look at the volume, in many papers they are saying, for instance, that a high volume center is the centers where you perform like 12 or 15 cystectomy a year, which is at least or minimum one a month, which is not high in reality. So when it comes to the perioperative morbidity, morbidity of radical cystectomy, the complication rate, the post-operative care, the nursing, immunonutrition, every details are very important and the quality of the cystectomy is also linked with the habits and the practice which is done in your institution. And if you are not very used to radical cystectomy, then you should have a center uh, to, whom you can, to which you can refer your patient in case of radical cystectomy. We don't know yet, regarding the surgical approach, if there is a difference, if there is a difference between open, pure laparoscopic or robotic approach. It's just uh, surgical access. Uh, for a long time, there was an ongoing debate around the risk of performing laparoscopic uh, or uh, cystectomy because there is always a theoretical risk of um, sitting with urotelial carcinoma in front of uh, gas environments. When it comes to laparoscopy, the only message that I would like to send tonight is if you have from the preoperative workup positive nodes or very invasive tumor, then you should avoid laparoscopic approach. When it comes to any invasive tumor, there is no data in the literature saying that there are uh, more uh, uh, worse outcome with laparoscopic approach. So the laparoscopic approach is safe when you perform a cystectomy unless you do it in positive nodes or very advanced disease, which is not something that we should do. So definitive answer is not provided yet and there is no superiority from the robot over the open approach and the vast majority of radical cystectomies all over the world are still performed with open approach nowadays. One last point that I would like to emphasize is the use of new adjuvant chemotherapy. As you can see from this slide, there are strong, strong paper coming from the literature. It's not a new concept because it's back in 2003. We have strong evidence showing that there is a significant improvement in survival in patients receiving new adjuvant chemotherapy before cystectomy. Of course, the gain is modest, but it exists and you cannot neglect it. And it's well written in the guidelines of the EAU and you can see it's a great air of recommendation. The new adjuvant chemotherapy is cystatin based. So of course, the benefit is seven, five to seven percent in five year survival benefit, but it would be you you would be happy to uh, benefit from this gain of survival. So you should raise the question in every tumor board when there is a case of radical cystectomy which is discussed. And when you deliver new adjuvant chemo, it's not a way to delay the treatment. New adjuvant chemo is a treatment. So some people are saying, okay, I'm not going to give new adjuvant chemo because I do not want to delay the treatment. You have to admit that new adjuvant chemo is a treatment, is a systemic treatment, and you have to have a good coordination, perfect local organization between the urologist and the oncologist. So, in any patients with muscle invasive bladder cancer, when you make a treatment decision, and when you go for surgical intervention, then you need to raise the question of new adjuvant chemo. 
I'm not saying to you tonight that every patient should undergo new adjuvant chemo. Which patient? The patient who has a good renal function, and that's mentioned on the slides. It's a yes, in my opinion, in my clinical practice, with patient with a good life expectancy, more than five years, and a renal function which, which is suitable for platinum-based chemotherapy. It's no, and I do not deliver new adjuvant chemotherapy in muscle invasive bladder cancer in the other situation when there is specifically a low GFR and also a poor performance status. So aside from the guidelines, I think that in our daily practice we should be able to discriminate uh, and to target the good candidates for new adjuvant chemo, and this is a subjective way to select the patient, but it is a reflect of my daily practice I wanted to share with you today. And last point about bladder cancer is that we need more research. For many, many years, as I told you in the beginning, for the last 40 years, the, the regimen of chemotherapy has not changed in bladder cancer. It's cisplatin-based cis chemo. The molecular knowledge has not improved. And now, in the last five years, there are new molecules, new drugs, that are entering the field from basic research and clinical research, and not only the immunotherapy with PDL1 and PD1 inhibitors, displaying new drugs that is a, a major opportunity for us to move the field of bladder cancer and to impact indeed on survival. So you will hear from these drugs uh, a lot during the next Congress of the EAU, any, manif uh, any, um, any scientific event you are going to, and, speci and specifically the molecular stratification of bladder cancer. It, was, it is already done in the field of colorectal surgery, for instance. You select the molecular form of the colorectal cancer and you deliver a certain type of chemotherapy. It's not yet a possibility in the field of bladder cancer, but there are people, there are people publishing in the literature from basic research saying that it is going to be possible within the next few months or few years, and I deeply believe that it is going to change the face of the disease because if we are able to select very early the patients who are going to benefit from the chemotherapy, then we will not waste time for them to be treated with a good regimen. So new drugs, good, people, good patients treatable based on molecular marker decision and not on clinical criteria because we are too much treating patients based on clinical criteria only today, and that's not enough. From this slide, you can see that the field of bladder cancer, which was totally neglected in urology during the last few years, is now rapidly evolving, and we can expect more and more drugs, more and more trials, and more and more meaningful data. So that is really important, either in non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, muscle invasive, and metastatic disease. So you can see that any situation is going to uh, have new uh, possibilities within the next few uh, months and few years. Thank you very much for your attention. We uh, expand a little bit the time we had to spend together uh, due to technical issue. I'm really sorry about that. Now I go back to my colleague Veronique Fay, who is uh, my chairwoman today, and maybe she has uh, some uh, questions from uh, the audience all over the world, and I would be happy to discuss during the next five, ten minutes. Veronique, you are listening to yes. you. Thank you, Professor Rupre, for your excellent talk. So, indeed, we have a few questions coming from our uh, from the audience. And, for example, Dr. Balzaro from Verona, uh, Italy, is asking the following question. The EOR, EORTC risk table to predict recurrence and progression in individual patients are based on old works based on 1 to 3 grading of cancer. So he said that it's an old grading indeed, and he asked if these tables are still useful now that we have a new grading system based in high or low grade. That's a very uh, important question because the only reason why we keep uh, the use of G1, G2, G3 tumor in non-muscle invasive bladder cancer is because of the EORTC table and the Queto table. And I think that we need a new model. The only thing that, the, uh, that we need to uh, emphasize that at the time of the EORTC table, it was based on a very large population. It's a huge work, massive impact on the decision and on the treatment that we are making. So it would be another massive task to change it, but I think it's a 
uh, it's the time to do it, and I fully agree with my colleague from Italy that uh, according to the new knowledge that we have in the field of pathology, according to the um, nomograms that we have today, according to the new criteria, which we should move on and leave defini definitively behind us the old classification of G1, G2, G3, but it is not ready yet. It means that in our daily practice, in our hospital in Paris, our pathologist, Eva Contera, is providing the two classifications, G1, G2, G3, and low-grade, high-grade. So then we can use both, but I do admit that it is not the perfect situation. Another question? Yes, so we've got another one from Dr. Hortelano from Almeria, Spain. So he asked, what do you think about BCG in muscle invasive bladder cancer? BCG, according to the guidelines and according to my daily practice, is not used in muscle invasive bladder cancer. But you can have some uh, difficult situation where the patient is reluctant to the surgery and when the patient, the anesthesiologist, as I mentioned, is telling you that the patient is not in a condition, physical condition, to undergo the surgery. And so some people are saying that you should use BCG and uh, re, uh, re resection uh, as a palliative option. I think it's not a good option, and in this patient, maybe you should consider rather than radical cystectomy or BCG, I would say radiation therapy combined with chemotherapy and, of course, re-resection. But it's systemic chemo plus radiation plus re-resection better than BCG in muscle invasive bladder cancer. Okay, thank you. So we've got time for other questions. So we talk indeed about uh, the benefits of neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So, what's the delay you, will, you would recommend between neoadjuvant chemotherapy and radical cystectomy? And the second question is, uh, how many cycles of neoadjuvant chemotherapy uh, would you recommend? Very important points because it's a concept, neoadjuvant chemo, and when you look at the literature, uh, the regimen and the number of cycles are different. So, it's very difficult to compare a study from another. What we do is at least four cycles. It depends on the tolerance of the patient, and you will do also another CT. It can be also high-density chemotherapy, and you have to discuss with your oncologist. In certain countries, like Germany, uh, the urologists are delivering themselves the chemo. In our country, for instance, France, we are uh, working together with oncologists in a good coordination. And the window after uh, the end of the chemo and the, the start of the procedure, the radical cystectomy, is at least in my practice one, uh, one month, four weeks, uh, because um, the patient is very fragile, uh, there is asthenia, and for the quality of the dissection of the tissue, it's still uh, better, in my opinion, to uh, have this window uh, before, um, between the end of the chemo and the start of the surgical procedure. Okay, thank you for your answer. So now another question for the, from Dr. Besser from Germany. He asked you what you think about image enhancement systems like NBI or SIA. Uh, yes, uh, important question. I told you that the technology has not changed the face of bladder cancer. The only technology so far which is available in the guidelines is the blue light. This is why I went through solid evidence. But I'm not denying the fact that these tools are very interesting with advances in endo-urology, especially the NBI, because the blue light can be very important to discriminate flat lesion in the re bladder reservoir, but when it comes to upper tract disease, it's very tricky to do an installation and to have a good exploration. So what I'm telling you today is that the new technology is not yet in the guidelines because we need more people enrolled in the studies. It is not because there is a booth on a scientific congress with a new tool that I'm convinced that you should use it in daily practice, but we should use it more and more, evaluate it, produce, produce good, meaningful data, and then maybe we enter the guidelines, because it's very expensive technology, so the only question is not whether or not it provides better images, it's be whether or not it, be it provides better outcome when it comes to treating the patient. Okay, so Professor Boucre, you said that the quality of the resection is uh, linked to the surgeon's experience. And so there is this question from Dr. Hortelano from uh, Spain. He asked how to deal then with a G3-T1 uh, tumor that a junior urologist cannot relieve in one or two resections. Shall we 
do it again, shall we see in your urologists to do it again, or do you uh, recommend uh, another treatment more invasive? First of all, any T1 hybrid uh, lesion should be re-resected. When you look at the guidelines, there is a second loop, which is called the second loop. So some people are saying, ah, I'm using the blue light from the, uh, from the beginning, so maybe I should not do a re-TURD. And in fact, T1 hybrid is second look. Second look does not mean I, I, I do a, T, a transuretralization of the bladder in two steps. I do a full step, and then I reschedule four weeks, four to five weeks after another procedure in the OR to check and to do biopsy on the tumor bed and to do biopsy uh, elsewhere. Uh, it depends whether or not you use the blue light, but it can be a random biopsy. And in my opinion, to be frank and to be honest, you should not leave a junior alone performing uh, a transuretralization of the bladder uh, on a T1 hybrid tumor. Of course, you will discover the pathology after the specimen has been removed, but you have also the size of the tumor, the multifocality, many criteria that can make you feel from the beginning that you are facing a high-risk tumor, and it's not a problem. The junior need to learn, but they need to learn surrounded by a teacher, and if they are not in a position to finish the procedure, then the, uh, the senior urologist should be in the room and uh, should be taking care of the patient. Okay, great. So, uh, there is now a question from Dr. Zamiatin who asks, so there is a shortage, shortage sorry, of BCG worldwide nowadays and this uh, situation is going to be continued in the future, so we have to face this problem. Can he ask you what kind of method of intravesical therapy or maybe another approach could be promising in replacing BCG? Replacing BCG, I don't know. For sure, we are facing a shortage in certain strain of BCG. And this is why from now on, we know that there are maybe differences between the strains, the strain we used, because before we never raised this question. And when the shortage appeared, then there was this question in the debate of the field of treatment of bladder cancer. So the differences between the strain. What is sure, well, when we are facing a high risk region, we should go for maintenance BCG at least one year. We don't know yet if we should go for three years, but at least one year of maintenance is better just than induction alone in high risk patients. That's a good message to uh, So we should fight to have at least one year of BCG. And maybe not three years when there is a shortage, but at least one year. When there is also a shortage, some people are advocating the fact that we should use uh, thermochemotherapy with the use of uh, mitomycin, for instance, Synergo, uh, which is a procedure which is used in certain centers. We have experience with few cases only. There are more and more data in the literature. It could be an alternative, and I'm using the conditional only. That's very interesting, and I'm looking carefully at the data and investigating the, the, the techniques, but so far, I could not recommend on a webcast that it is superior to BCG. Okay. One, one, last two questions, Veronique, because yes. we need to close the session. The attendants are very active, so thank you all for your questions. So just a small question from Dr. Zwiebelnou from the Netherlands. He asks you, after neo-driven chemotherapy, do you encounter any problems during surgery after this treatment, or is it and that's a very subjective point that has been uh, emphasized by certain uh, teams when they do not want to perform uh, the new adjuvant chemo, saying, ah, you know, the surgery is much more difficult, I, I face more complications. There are indeed very serious data from the literature saying that it is not uh, more complicated and you can perform a good surgery in very good condition, very good situation after chemotherapy, and uh, this is coming from the data, as, as far as I am concerned, when I perform my uh, radical cystectomy in patient who underwent new adjuvant chemo, I never had to complain about particular uh, difficulties. Okay, great. So I think that we have to uh, close the session. So thank you all our attendants for the questions. Uh, thank you for being here for the first uh, webinar. Um, thank you, Veronique, for uh, taking the time to, uh, to, to discuss the cancer issue today, even if you are much more involved in functional urology, and I hope we will have the opportunity to share a webinar with you as a presenter. Uh, I would like to thank the team of the EAU working behind the screen. Even though we had a technical issue, it's not an easy uh, um, thing to organize, and I think uh, we should move on with webinar, and we need to do positive and negative feedback, of course, because we are working 
in front of the screen, but we know that you are behind and uh, we are trying to interact as much as we can and we need to extend the use of these new tools. This is why we will move on and keep moving forward with the webinar and with the uh, next one is webinar number two with Professor Marcus Drake, who is going to talk about aerodynamics on the 24th of May, same timeline. So please um, uh, send us your message, send us your feedback, and thank you for being connected with us today. It was a pleasure to share this first session with you. Have a very nice evening in your country and see you soon in the next uh, Eurological Congress. Uh, take care. Bye-bye. See you soon. Bye. Thank you.